great pleasure um, I'm able to introduce to you Ron Brownson, who works here at the gallery as a senior curator in charge of the research collections. Um, Ron has a long-standing um, involvement in the work of Rita Angus. In the 1970s, he completed an MA thesis on Angus's work, and in the early part of the 80s, he was involved with a group of people who put together um, a large touring retrospective of her work, which many of you may have seen. Um, um, and he's going to speak to us today about two words by Rita Angus. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. I've chosen to address this painting, this painting here, rather than the other four paintings in the exhibition. And I'm delighted that this art museum has accorded Rita Angus the same number of pictures, it's five pictures, as William Hodges has. It's one less than Augustus Earl, and this would have delighted her. She disliked this city intensely. <laughs> but she respected this museum. And we're proud that some of her greatest works are, are secured for the public visiting here. This is one of them, this painting in Central Otago. So here in this exhibition, Rita Angus has shown in a comprehensive context of New Zealand artists, and this has occurred once before for her, only once before, and that was in 1940, when the National Centennial Exhibition was shown here. It was shown about 18 feet above us. We're sitting. Okay. So uh, Rita Angus was a modest painter. Uh, no, no, she wasn't a modest person. She was a modest person. She wasn't really a modest painter. She became very angry when she felt her work was being promoted above peers that she herself respected. And this Hamish Keith and Gordon Brown is sitting with us today both the champions of her art. They were both thwarted in their desire to devote a substantive account of, about her work in their 1969 book, An Introduction to New Zealand Painting. Is that right, Gordon? Yes. Actually, it's, she was so angry that she might be seen to be above those that were her, her co-equals, if you like, her peers, that she spent night after night drafting letters to Gordon about why she wouldn't uh, allow herself to have a more comprehensive treatment. But when Gordon and Hamish were preparing their book, Introduction to New Zealand Painting, Rita Angus was already very ill. And this was with the malady that killed her. She was furious that this museum had purchased her great painting, Far Corks Bay, which is in the Wellesley Gallery, just around the corner. A painting she had laid on for over two years, from 1966 until 1968. She was furious not because she didn't feel it was one of her most profound renditions of New Zealand landscape, but because she had not been involved in its purchase. Rita Angus liked to 
determine where her paintings would eventually live. She believed that her life and her art were hers to determine. She refused to accept that her painting was a market product. She felt that her painting was her gift to New Zealand, almost her child in New Zealand, if I can be permitted to say that. She wanted to ensure that the very best of her work had the very best future. This is why she chose and selected the National Art Gallery as the resting place of her painting estate. I wish to thank her heirs today for their magnificent generosity in making available to everyone in New Zealand. It has now been 20 years that they have done this, the collection, their collection of her work, which numbers many thousands of items. But when I was in the middle of my research on Rita Angus, um, Colin McCann had kind of talked to me a number of times about his friendship with uh, Rita Angus, and he said to me, Rita Angus knew where she lived and what she painted. So I want to speak of Rita Angus when she was painting this watercolor here, Mountains Cass. She had just moved into her studio flat, and it was unusual to have uh, such a young person in a studio flat, but she had her own studio flat in Cambridge Terrace, Christchurch. The year's February 1937, and she's one month from being 29 years old. She's been separated from her husband, Alfred Cook, for nearly three years. She's made new friends, real friends, Jean Stevenson, editor of the Press Junior, later become Jean Bertram, the painters Louise Henderson and Olivia Spencer Baum, the sculptor Francis Sharrock, and the men Leo Bensman and Lawrence Bajan, who are about to be her best men friends. In fact, Lawrence gave that painting to the city of Christchurch. <coughs> This is her and her studio flat. It's a big, heavy thing. These photographs were taken by the press. Yes, these are snaps I found somewhere along the way. and she is a painter. So for the first time in her life, she can choose to be independent. Yet this is only after much pain caused by her dissolved marriage and her isolation from her family living in the North Island. Yet she survives and earns a living as an artist illustrator for the press. She manages a picture lending library, which is all these pictures on her studio wall are the library pictures that you can go along and hire them for two shillings a month. <laughs> library cards. <laughs> when they went in and when they went out, all that sort of thing. She took it very seriously. Um, in fact, that library did have an effect on the Canterbury Public Library because they, about 20 years later, purchased um, a Wollaston um, Four drawings by Colin McCann, a Rita Angus Wartheim. She used to be able to go in there and for two shillings you could have an original on your wall. I saw what happened one day. Someone um, felt it was an extremely good um, investment and the uh, picture didn't return, so they thought that reference only would save them. Yeah. So here we are. She's, she's looking after this lending service for pictures from her flat. And, they're pictures by others she knows and has met since attending the Canterbury College of Art. She's able to believe in herself. She wants to see herself and begins the third of her many self-portraits in the winter of 1936. This one, which if you saw the exhibition, you would remember. I want you to see Rita Angus at the moment that she's painting this picture. Sydney Thompson, the man who painted that picture at the back of the big one, allowed her to um, sort of really chose her for the flat. Um, and this self-portrait I've just shown you in the Dunedin Public Art Gallery, it's, it's a wonderful picture because 
when you think of these rangers, you realize that no other New Zealand artist has recorded their own self, their representation of their self, its appearance over time, with the acuity of Rita Angus. And uh, this portrait that I just showed you, this looks like going to this <laughs> um, Anyway, mm -hmm. there it is. This portrait remains the most prescient self-portrait, or one of the most prescient self-portraits of any artist working <coughs> in New Zealand. And Tony Farnison, I think, her only equal in psychological portraiture, told me when he looked at it with me in the show when we had it here, that he'd never seen, quote, such a mirror of marriage's destruction. Tony laughed, and only that way he could laugh when I told him a conservator had destroyed the significance, perhaps, of her self-portrait through over-cleaning her self-portrait's glazes. There was a little caricatured um, smoke outline of her husband's face. Mm -hmm. So, in late 1936, Louise Henderson and Rita Angus traveled by train to Cass. Cass here. Near Arthur's Pass, and stayed at the uh, University of Canterbury hut there. From there, they made daily forays into the landscape and sketched with pencil, chalk, and watercolor. And Rita Angus made a large preparatory drawing for this work. And this sketch, which is in the National Gallery, is certainly one of the best outdoor drawings of the period. In fact, it's probably one of the best outdoor drawing period by anyone in 1936. It was completed. She took the um, sketch back to her studio, and it was there that she worked up from the sketch, which is this one. You can see how close it is, and it's almost as large. Okay, so she's working on this watercolor. This is back to front, by the way. And she's working on this oil, which is Cass Railway Station, which is a much smaller picture. It's about, oh, about the size of that frame. Oil painting cast. So as a result of that trip, she does two pictures. She does this one in watercolor and this one in oil. Now, this oil cast wasn't available for this exhibition. We wanted it, but we just couldn't get it. But the two pictures, the watercolor and the oil, were painted as a pair, which hasn't really previously been noted, I think. When they were shown together at the Canterbury Society of Arts for the first time, they were hung in different rooms. That was at the accepted mode of presentation there, then. So that they were first shown, they couldn't be seen for what they really are, a pair of paintings, views of opposite sides of the valley about the railway. It's like looking left and looking right. That's basically what the views you're getting. So in this picture, this little oil, Rita Angus shows the present life of Cass as a once significant coach stop. She's breaking away from the prosaic, yet, yet academic subject matter prevalent in Christchurch um, to indicate a building and a building in both. Buildings in a landscape which are uniquely connected to where they are and what they are for. What they are for now and what they were for once. So this watercolor Mountains Cass represents a landscape of a past life, a past present <coughs> presence, a removal from habitation, a generation ago, two generations ago, probably two generations ago, I think. A building falling in ruin and abandoned. She said Cass was a subject already to be seen. Her breakthrough was that she was really able to see it. So she approaches her watercolor with an intense knowing sense of the tradition of watercolor painting in New Zealand, especially in the South Island. She knew the early watercolor paintings kept in the Canterbury Museum. She'd studied them closely. She understood that the topographic mode where a landform record, record, a landform record requires the artist to render more or less shape and volume as they naturally appear to the eye. She understood that topography did not have to be contained by truths of scale. Truth
truths of shape, truths of volume, truths of lighting, truths of texture. She was ambitious. She knew she had the oil and color technique to attempt a large visual statement. She upheld that Eastern philosophic maxim that the physical size of an art object does not lessen any potential for monumentality. I've reread comments made to me in the last couple of Comments that were made 15, 10 years ago. Comments made to me by Olivia Spencer Barr and Colin McCann and Leo Bensonman. And uh, from my notes, I realized that each felt that Rita Angus was akin to being a painter's painter. I'm not going to explain what that means. I think you just have to. Because I don't think. I can. I think to understand what they meant by saying they felt she was a painter's painter, I think you have to look at Rita Angus's work. And then when you're looking at Rita Angus's work and you're perhaps thinking about her pictures in the way that a painter might think about her pictures, you suddenly realize that she has such an incredible technical facility and that you're often not aware of it. This um, carpeting from White Knight, for instance, this watercolor, is so fresh and so open and so airy, and yet any painter who works with watercolor who looks at that realizes that that has been made after a huge series of dry runs, if you like, a huge number of failures. Which is recognized by another artist. He understands the input. I think that, oh, that's it. I think that, that there's a self-editing going on with Rita Angus that a lot of artists are perhaps some not, sometimes not prepared to do. It. I mean, you was a photographer with that. No, I've course. always wanted to know what it. was the term meant, you know, the term that was meant by a painter's painter. Well, they and say I'm that... I'm glad for your definition. Yeah, they you. say that about Velasquez, and I saw the Velasquez retrospective in New York, and I had never experienced anything like it, because it was filled with people, like a room as big as this, filled with as many people, and no one was saying anything. The work somehow had such a subcutaneous effect on you that it just spoke right through language. And it was just, it was emotion. And to regress, though, to what Olivia said to me about when she was recalling this watercolor, because she knew it well, a mutual friend in Christchurch owned it, she said, it has mystery without any touches of florid sentiment. Leo, Leo Bensman said that he had seen Rita paint it and that she had painted it very, very, very slowly. And he had a big deep voice and he said that very well. And he painted it, she painted it very slowly over late spring and summer of 1936 and 37. She would use her black chalk and watercolor outdoor sketch almost as a meditation device. I know that gives you a, a slightly wrong perspective, but I want you to think that she's got that outdoor sketch, she's taking it back, she's done, she did the outdoor sketch over a number of days, and that was passed, didn't it happen one afternoon? She made the sketch over a number of days, she took it back to Christchurch, and that was the, that was the visual generator, if you like, of this work. Okay, and he said to me, she used to practice brush, brush gestures on other pieces of paper and only apply the brush when she had repeatedly made the gesture and got it correct. And I was thinking of this again, I was thinking, this has been painted slowly because you can't see any mistakes. There are some, I think, but they don't, the gestures don't have that self-consciousness which a mistake does. So when I look at this watercolor, I'm very excited. It's all animated, it's all in motion. It's full of air, it's full of light effects, it's full of rhythms, patterns, accents, and juxtapositions. Colin McCann was showing this watercolor after he had admired the oil cast in Rita's studio on a visit there in 1939, take, take to meet Rita by mutual friend. And uh, Cass was, he said, when we were talking about it in Partridge Street, he said this, he said, 
I quote, something I knew, it has to be something I knew, the sheds cut into land for shelter. Witta got the composition right. When she didn't, she got it wrong. Always either right or wrong, never ever, no never, in between right or wrong. <coughs> Nellie Eagle said to me yesterday that John Oakley had noted to her that Rita Angus took her subject from Rata Lovell Smith. And that painting above the nickel over there, that, that snow that's in bright light, that's an outdoor sketch. It's a superb outdoor sketch by Rata Lovell Smith. And that is the sort of painting that John Oakley was referring to. I think because he also said it to me um, about the connection he saw between Rata Lovell Smith and Rita Angus, he was being critical. But I don't see it as a criticism. And Rita Angus really admired Rata Lovell Smith, and she emulated the painting process, which was to leave Christchurch and to go out into the hinterland and probably get as far away from the plains as you could. The example of Petrus van der Velden, to be sure. I just want to uh, stop talking, but I do want to say this um, because I haven't really said it about Rita Angus public, and I would like to say it. Um, her reputation as an artist results from her 40 year career as a painter, and she spans the middle of the century, 1950, when she was 42 years old. Yet it is not 1950 that she did her best work. It was 10 years earlier, and only after 10 years later. 1950 for Rita Angus was an end to almost three years of trauma and a welcome beginning to reconstruction, both personally and professionally. So her family gathered about her and saw her through a crisis in her life. Greater paintings were on her heart. 